forensic psychological evaluation of Amber Heard. And please tell the jury what a forensic psychological evaluation is. Sure. You, can you turn it on at the bottom base? Okay. Um, a forensic psychological evaluation is an evaluation that is conducted for the courts to answer a particular legal question. Um, it contains multiple parts. Um, Ms. Heard is not a client of mine. She's never been in therapy with me. I'm not under my clinical care. It is an objective evaluation to determine a particular legal question. A uh, forensic evaluation follows a methodology that what we say it's, it's a multi-method, multi-hypothesis-driven methodology, which means I look at a variety of different um, documents and data using multiple hypotheses. It's not just one hypothesis, one theory of the case. You're going in looking to see, you know, what possibly could be going on here. And then you use the data to arrive at that opinion. You look for consistency across the data to arrive at that opinion. Um, and the forensic psychological evaluation has many parts. It has the clinical interview part, a structured or semi-structured clinical interview where I'm asking Ms. Hurd lots of things about her life, both before um, Mr. Depp and after. It involves a psychological testing component of the evaluation, which allows me to do a good broad scan of different symptomatologies that people might have in their lives, as well as to have indicators of how she approached the test. Is she defensive? Is she malingering? Is she feigning? Is she exaggerating? It gives me indications um, about how she approached the evaluation. I review a number of documents, um, medical records, psychological records, the text, the audio, all the different things that we've had in this case, um, and then I conduct collateral interviews. So, Dr. Hughes, do you, just to be clear, do you assume everything uh, the victim reports is true when you conduct these examinations? No, uh, of course not. I always approach a forensic evaluation with a healthy dose of skepticism. Um, with any forensic evaluation, there, there exists a motivation that the individual may be telling you something that is not accurate. It doesn't mean that that's there, but you have to control for that um, and know that you're looking for, again, what does the data tell you, the external data, about what the person is also telling you. Did the forensic evaluation follow a standard methodology or was it specific to Ms. Hurd? No, this is my standard methodology that I would use with any individual um, who's in a forensic matter and I would just call to evaluate them. Okay. When did you meet with Amber Hurd? Okay, so I met with Ms. Hurd um, for a total of about 29 hours. I met with her for the first time in September 2019. I saw her for four visits um, in live uh, in my New York City office. Um, I, that's about 21, 22 hours. And then I saw her twice over Zoom. One was in January 2021. And you approach? Okay. We have seen this pretty often, a lot of objections, a lot of approaching, and one wonders, are these things that couldn't have been resolved pre-trial? Let me bring in, because I'm, I'm puzzled as to how many sidebars they continue to have in this civil case. Still with us, Nima Romani. Nima, what are your thoughts? I agree, Ashley, lots of sidebars. I mean, jurors already are hesitant. This is a very long trial. You don't wanna be wasting their time. And we saw this a lot with Amber Heard's defense team, lots of objections, lots of sidebars. I wish this particular judge had better control of the courtroom, moved things along, was more efficient and controlled the attorneys. These are things that could have and should have been handled outside the presence of the jurors. Yep, agree, let's go back to court. Were you consulting anything, Dr. Hughes? Dr. Hughes, I'm so sorry. Uh, Dr. Hughes, were you consulting anything? Dr. Curry's here, I guess, as well. Maybe that's what confusing us. <laughs> um, right I'm consulting my cheat sheet of the dates that I saw Ms. Heard so that I could accurately um, report to the court. I also have my final designation in front of me so that I could give the most accurate information to what I put in that report. Okay, okay. And it, it, do you want to see that? Okay, should we just take the break now and have him look at it, or does he want to? Would you like to look at it now or before cross examination? It's just a post it. I'm happy to look at it before cross examination. Okay, before cross examination. Okay, all right, that's, that's fine. fine. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, please continue. I think you were telling us when you saw Ms. Heard. Sure. Um, so there were four dates uh, in person in New York City uh, for a total of about 21 and a half hours. And then I saw her um, in January 18th, 2021, over Zoom for three hours, and then December 27th, 2021, uh, for four hours over Zoom. And what did the evaluation consist of? So as I stated, the evaluation consisted of uh, psychological testing, a semi-structured clinical interview with Ms. Hurd, a review of a whole host of documents relative to this case and medical records and psychological records, and then three collateral interviews, two with her treating therapist, uh, Dr. Bonnie Jacobs, Dr. Connell Cohen, and also with her mom. And in the semi-structured clinical interview, what were you assessing? Well, when someone comes in for the evaluation, you sometimes don't know what you're going to see or what you're going to get. So you absolutely have to do a, a full clinical interview and have a sense of their life, their life patterns, things that have affected them in their lives, you know, where they have worked, where they have lived, just get a full sense of their, um, their sort of being before the incident for which they're talking about. Then I do a full intimate partner violence assessment, looking at all those characteristics that I talked to you about earlier to get a sense of the full um, structure of and the dynamic of this relationship. Um, I also did uh, looking at what were the effects, what were the psychological consequences of being in that relationship. And I also looked at the psychological consequences of some of the statements um, that were made by uh, Mr. Depp through his attorney that are part of this, uh, the counterclaim in this lawsuit. At the end of that process, considering all the data, uh, did you arrive at any expert opinions? Yes, I did. All right. I'm going, I would like to start with your main expert opinions uh, and then go through those. Can you please tell the jury what your main opinions were? Um, so like I said, there are opinions embedded within them, but the main opinion is that um, Ms. Hurd's report of intimate partner violence um, and the records that I reviewed is consistent with what we know in the field about intimate partner violence, characterized by physical violence, psychological aggression, sexual violence, coercive control, and surveillance behaviors. And what was the other uh, main opinion that you had? Um, the second main opinion was that um, that Ms. Hurd demonstrated very clear psychological and traumatic effects or the exacerbation of trauma from those statements that Mr. Depp made through his attorney. There were three statements um, that we evaluated to see how they affected her emotionally and psychologically. And it was in my determination that they did. And did you arrive at any diagnostic conclusions? Yes, I did. And what were those? I diagnosed uh, Ms. Hurd with post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and what, if any, etiology was associated with the post-traumatic stress disorder? So the etiology is the cause um, to, in order to have a, to meet criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder, you have to have an actual cause. It's one of the few diagnoses, diagnostic entities that we have to co have a cause for. And um, the cause was the intimate partner violence by Mr. Depp. That was the, what was pushing the symptoms. That was what was related to the intrusive phenomena. That was related to her avoidance. That was related to her um, differences in her mood that was related to her avoidance efforts. Um, so it was the, the cause was the intimate partner violence by Mr. Depp. Okay. Now, let's first go back to the forensic evaluation. You mentioned you reviewed documents. What documents did you review? So I'm going to refer to my list of documents so that I can be clear for you all. Um, it is a four page. All right, if you want to approach. You know, I just have to comment, we're at another sidebar. And again, pretrial motions, even though this is a civil case, different from a criminal case, the judge 
hears a lot of things before you ever get into the courtroom to try a case, including what can and cannot be allowed into evidence, any objections, any arguments. And the reason that's done in part is to allow a case to be presented to a jury without wasting the jury's time by having to continually go up to the bench. And so I guess I'm a little surprised at this point in the game that they do continue to have this many sidebars. It shouldn't be a surprise as to what this expert was called to testify to given discovery is allowed by both sides. And that's when they actually get to see exactly what the other side has and is gonna present as evidence. Now, the significant piece of testimony at this point that Amber Heard was diagnosed by Dr. Dawn Hughes with post-traumatic stress disorder. And then she went one step further to say the cause of that PTSD was intimate partner violence by, by Johnny Depp. Nima Romani still with me. Intimate partner violence by Mr. Depp. As soon as I heard that, I said, you know what, out loud, um, this cross-examination may be pretty lengthy. Oh, I agree. And, and actually, when it comes to this sidebar, it is not necessary. We're talking about an elementary evidentiary objection. The witness can't read from her notes. She needs to refresh her recollection. Her attorney can simply lay the foundation. Any notes need to be disclosed to the other attorney. Again, these are things that we see in every trial in every courtroom in the country. I don't understand why we need a sidebar for something as simple as this. But to address your substantive point, I mean, that is an important conclusion that Dr. Hughes made. We're talking about surveillance, we're talking about physical and emotional abuse, uh, not to mention the sexual violence in that force. So this is gonna be a long and lengthy cross-examination, Ashley, I completely yeah, agree with you. I agree, and, and the other thing that always bothers me, and I've said this about this trial, very smart attorneys, very well-trained attorneys, but it doesn't necessarily mean they've tried a case or know how to try a case. I think that we do have to squeeze in a break, but we'll make certain you do not miss any of this testimony. We're gonna hit the pause button. We'll be right back on the other side. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Judge Ashley Wilcott. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We want to take you back into the courtroom in Fairfax, Virginia. On the stand, Amber Heard's first witness, a forensic psychologist. She did a forensic evaluation of Amber Heard, meaning Amber's not her client, but she met with her. She reviewed all the information. Here's what we just learned from her before the break, and that is that she diagnosed Amber Heard with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and further, that the cause of that PTSD was intimate partner violence by Mr. Depp. We hit the pause button. You haven't missed any of her testimony. Let's go back to where she left off. I think it's the confusion of having her in the courtroom. Um, Dr. Hughes, uh, if, um, if you need to consult your notes to answer something, let us know that you need to consult your notes. Um, otherwise, Try to answer to the best of your ability. And then if, if you need to do that, just let us know you're consulting your notes, okay? Um, the concern is uh, that you not read from them, that you consult them as you need to, okay? Correct, I just don't want this to be a memory test of having conducted many documents, 80 pages of notes, but you, and 12 you can, psychological testings to... You can reference your notes, just don't read from them, okay? Yeah, no problem. Okay, okay great. So please tell us what documents you reviewed. Please tell the jury. Okay, so I reviewed uh, a number of documents, a, a plethora of documents, um, most, and I obviously won't read them all, um, but I reviewed certainly all of um, Ms. Hurd's testimony that she gave um, in her deposition testimony, her deposition testimony in this case, her deposition or her trial testimony in the UK case. Um, I did the same thing for Mr. Depp. I reviewed his deposition testimony as well as his trial testimony um, in the UK as well. I reviewed, uh, a number of the depositions that were put forth in this case. I reviewed the psychological treatment notes for Dr. Bonnie Jacobs, Dr. Connell Cohen, 
Dr. Laurel Anderson and Dr. Amy Banks, although she did not have treatment records, so I reviewed not only their records, did collateral interviews with some of them, and also read their deposition testimony, um, and also read um, other medical records in this case, um, nursing notes in this case, um, in the highlights. And I also listened to um, the audios that were put forth in this case and read the text messages and emails. And what, if anything, did you do with respect to any videos? And I also saw um, the video in the kitchen, yes. Okay. Now, the collateral interviews that you conducted, why did you conduct those? Well, collateral interviews is a standard part of a forensic evaluation. It's an opportunity to hear from another treating clinician, the person who's actually treating the individual you're evaluating, and get a better sense from that person of what they saw, what they knew, how they experienced this person. Sometimes our clinical notes don't give the full breadth of um, what really was going on in that therapy because the notes are meant to be sort of shortened to the point of what was what happened, who was there, and what was the plan. Um, so it was really helpful to talk to um, these two clinicians who really were with um, Ms. Hurd throughout the duration of her relationship with Mr. Depp. So they give us sort of a contemporaneous um, look at what was going on for her emotionally. And then what was she reporting? What was she saying about the relationship um, to her therapist? And, and you mentioned the name Dr. Bonnie Jacobs. Please tell the jury who Dr. Bonnie Jacobs is. So Dr. Bonnie Jacobs was um, Ms. Hurd's therapist. And may I refresh my recollection with my notes, Your Honor? She's, she's allowed to For consult the notes. If you'd like me to tell the dates. If she's asking me a question, uh, I'm yeah, not you're, answer. you're right, Your Honor. I'll just, yes. May I? Yes, you may consult your notes, yes. Objection, Your Honor. Can we be here? All right, Johnny Depp is in his chair turning around. It looks like he is about to double over with laughter. Like, I don't know what he's doing, but you saw as he started to turn, he was laughing. And it still looks like he's laughing. He's there. That's a live shot. And I have to tell you, Nima Romani still with me. As a former judge, I would have had it at this point. Because guess what? You've got to know the basic trial skills. If you're going to come in my courtroom and try a case, and we've got a jury that's sitting listening to days of testimony, you better know how to lay a foundation. Do you have anything you're looking at? Yes. What are they? Notes. Do you need to look at those to refresh your recollection? Yes. All right, Judge. I ask that the witness be able to look at their notes to refresh the recollection. What is the problem, in your opinion, of how this is going and why they're yet again up at the bench? You know, maybe this is civil attorneys who don't regularly try cases, Ashley, but this is something every second and third year law student should know how to do. Lay the foundation. Witnesses can refresh their recollection. This is not, sidebars aren't necessary here. Yeah, I completely agree with you. We do need to take a quick break. I think we're going to hit the pause button because this testimony is very important to Amber Heard's case. We won't let you miss any of it. We're going to take you back there after a short break here on Court TV, your front row seat to justice. 6363. Dr. Dawn Hughes, the psychologist who did a forensic evaluation of Amber Heard, first witness for Amber Heard on the stand. Let's go back to court. 2011 um, through August 2014. Um, she actually was seeing Ms. Dr. Jacobs somewhat earlier before she got in the relationship with Mr. Depp. Um, and then she transferred care to Dr. Connell Cohen, who was referred by Dr. Kipper, who was um, the treating physician for uh, Mr. Depp and then uh, later for Ms. Hurd. And she treated with Dr. Cohen from um, after she left Dr. Bonnie Jacobs in September 2014 to June 7th, 2016. Okay, thank you. Um, and so you, and I guess you got ahead of me there, so you also talked to Dr. Connell Cohen, correct? That's correct. Okay. And you also spoke with Paige Hurd, did you say? That's correct. And who is Paige Hurd? Paige Hurd is Amber Hurd's mother. Okay. And when did you speak with Paige Hurd? I, I spoke with all of these individuals at the end of 2019. Again, I can check my notes and let you know the exact date if you'd like. 
I think the end of 19. Yeah, they all were in the end of 19. Yes. All right. And, and you are, are you aware that Paige Hurd has, has since died? She died two years ago? Yes, I, I am aware, sadly. Okay. Now, let's talk about the psychological testing. Uh, you stated that you conducted psychological testing, is that correct? That is correct. Can you... Yeah, overruled all of them. Can you please tell, uh, tell the jury how many psychological assessments you administered to Amber Heard? I administered 12. Can you please tell, them, tell the jury what, which ones you administered? So I am going to refer to my designation that has the list so that I don't forget anything. Okay. So I administered... Um, Objection, hearsay, Your Honor. She can refresh her recollection. As long as she's not reading it. Right, you just can't read. That You're not supposed to read from it, but you can refresh your recollection as you're speaking. So I can look and just look up and that's refreshing my recollection? Okay. All right, if we could approach for a moment. All right, Nima Romani still with me. I feel like I just heard laughter in the courtroom. I can't wait to talk with Chanley Painter next time we have the opportunity. She's in that courtroom so she can report on exactly what's happening. But Nima, again, okay, I was talking with my producer in my ear and the perception of the jury. How do you think this is affecting the credibility of this witness and Amber Heard's legal team as this jury is watching all these objections? You know, I see Chanley in there too, Ashley, and I think it actually affects the Depp legal team because on social media, everyone's talking about all the objections, how they've been obstructionists, how they're trying to withhold evidence from the jury. And just listen, just let her refresh her recollection, read the 12 tests she conducted, and let's move on. This is wasting time. There's no reason why this witness should not be able to refresh her recollection. Part of it, though, is Heard's attorney not doing a good job set laying the foundation for her to do so. Right, and I do wonder if she's getting rattled by all the objections, I don't know, but she certainly has accidentally called Dr. Hughes the wrong name twice. She's called her Dr. Curry. Dr. Curry is the one with the black glasses and the black shirt that you see on your screen now. Now remember, that is the expert that testified for Johnny Depp. Now, some viewers have said, why is she allowed in the courtroom? The rule of sequestration is in place because experts are allowed to be in the courtroom to hear testimony. And I can almost promise you that we're going to see Dr. Shannon Curry on rebuttal because this, the DEP team, the petitioners or plaintiffs in this case, will have that opportunity. Nima, would you put Dr. Curry up on rebuttal? Yes, no question. We're seeing a completely different diagnosis here. PTSD, which actually, Ashley, you called off the air. So kudos to you. Very different from obviously the borderline and histrionic personality disorder. So the jurors are going to want to hear Dr. Curry's rebuttal to Dr. Hughes. Absolutely. And I think PTSD is, is the not only thing that can help, but will help the most. Let me see if we can go back to court. I'm not sure if she's, con oh, this is a, a prior clip. So they're still up at a sidebar. I didn't want viewers to think that she's continuing to testify yet. Were there any tests now she is, let's go back to court. That were designed to reveal malingering or feigning. Yes, there were. Okay, can you please tell the jury about those? So malingering um, is the false production of psychological symptomatology for the purpose of some external material gain. Feigning is uh, the false projection of, of psychological symptomatology with no identification of what that gain may be. Um, so basically feigning is saying your mental health is worse than it actually is. Um, so I administered uh, three of the tests had validity indices built in that could allow us to uh, address that question. The MFAS, the Miller Assessment, uh, a Forensic Assessment of Symptoms Test, is a specific malingering instrument. It, it looks at malingering psychopathology. Is this someone, you know, malingering psychopathology? Um, she scored a zero on that scale. Um, so on that, on that test, sorry, not the scale, that test. Um, so on that test, there was no evidence of malingering. On the TSI, there are two 
uh, validity indices, and she scored within the normal range on those scores as well. One was slightly elevated, but when in testing uh, the limits, um, because it has rare symptoms and uh, over-endorsed symptoms, um, I determined that that also was a, a valid measure. And then finally, the PAI, the, the large scale, 344 question instrument, has very robust validity scales on it to test for exaggeration or feigning or malingering, um, and she did not score in any of those scores and those scales at all, those were not elevated. So the combined results between those three tests um, suggest to me that Ms. Hurd is not malingering her psychological symptomatology. Now, Dr. Curry testified that one test showed, quote, intentional exaggeration in the 98th percentile, meaning that she engaged in extreme levels of exaggeration, end of quote. Do you agree with that? I do not. Why? Because that test, the, the scale that she is referring to, is the it's called ATR. It's the atypical response scale. As I said, that combines rare symptoms and over-endorsed symptoms. It's very frequently elevated in people who have high levels of distress. And then importantly, on this test specifically, it says do not use the percentile rank. It is in the manual. It is in italicies because the way that this test was normed, it was normed on people who have trauma. So it, it's what we call negatively skewed. That means that it falls on the tail end of the continuum. It is not a normal curve where we would normal think, normally think of how a percentile would work. So you would not use the percentile rank on this test. You want to approach? Yes, please. Okay. Nima, I know that you are going to be back with us next hour, but while we have a few more minutes before we get there, what do you think of the testimony just provided by, again, Dr. Don Hughes, who is a forensic, who did a forensic evaluation, psychological evaluation on Amber Heard? So far, so good for Amber Heard. I mean, one of the big issues that Dr. Curry testified to was this malingering, that she was exaggerating her symptoms. And that was a key part of her testimony. And now you have Dr. Hughes saying, no, 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 you actually conducted the test wrong and you actually went against the specific instructions in the book. So a good testimony so far for Dr. Hughes and Amber Heard's team. And I will say this, the other part of it is that she did testify when she was laying all the foundation that she did see Amber Heard for approximately 21 and a half hours total. From my perspective as a judge on the bench, I gotta tell you, Nima, that's a lot of time. Frequently, you'll have an expert who says, oh, I spent two and a half hours with that person. And of course, that's something that's attacked during closing arguments. But 21 and a half hours with Amber Heard is a lot. That is a lot, Ashley. And we have capital cases where experts are testifying as to competency and really folks may be going away for the rest of their life and you'll maybe get a half day or a full day. This is a lot of time spent directly with Amber Heard. And importantly, she spoke to all of our other treating providers. So a very comprehensive examination and discussion here by Dr. Hughes. Yeah, absolutely agree with you. I know we're getting close to the top of the hour when we are going to have to take a break. Let's do a little bit of a reset. We're showing you live. You're seeing all of it. We're not letting you miss any of this testimony by Dr. Don Hughes. And you can see a lot of objections, a lot of sidebars. Those continue. We're going to bring all of it to you. Now, we do have to get in that break. But when we do come back, we'll go back to that depth trial. Nima Romani, of course, will stay with us. And part of what we're going to look forward to is when the court has a break and when we're able to hear from Chanley Painter, whether it's this hour, next hour, because she is going to be able to tell us exactly how everyone's reacting in that courtroom. Was Johnny Depp laughing? And how is Amber Heard reacting? She'll bring all that to us next time she can step out. Stay with us here on Court TV, your front row seat to justice. Well, your hard work pays off. Good afternoon. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Judge Ashley Wilcott. Always honored to be with you. We're going to take you straight back into the courtroom in Fairfax, Virginia. Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard on the stand. Amber's very first witness, an expert, a forensic psychologist who did an evaluation of Amber Heard. She's already said that she diagnosed Amber Heard with PTSD caused at the hands of Johnny Depp. Let's take you back in the courtroom. You haven't missed any of her testimony.
Dr. Hughes, please continue. Um, so that is a, a very inaccurate way to describe that scale and that test. Um, and and so it, the ATR scale on this test is probably the least robust of our validity scales, so you would never make uh, a comment like that based on one scale if you don't have consistency across data. Um, and when you look at the consistency across the testing with the PAI, the TSI and the MFAS, and there's research to support that, that when they go together, you have a higher degree of likelihood that this is not feigned PTSD, that this is not feigned symptomatology. Um, and then actually, if I look at the validity scores on the MMPI-2 that Dr. Curry administered, those scales are not elevated for exaggeration or malingering either. So if I add that, now I have really robust data that Ms. Hurd is not malingering or feigning her psychological symptomatology. Thank you. Did you administer any tests that are specific to domestic violence? Yes, I did. Which ones? So that was the con conflict tactic scale, the abusive behavior observation checklist, and the danger assessment scale. And what did they show? I um, would like to refer to the testing. To refresh, to your refresh recollection. my recollection. Just a glance so yes, I can you may be clear with the jury. So what the um, overall gist of the testing was, was that, um, and the, the benefit of these tests is that they allow me to ask for what Mr. Depp did to Ms. Hurd and then also what Ms. Hurd did to Mr. Depp. So it was asking about both sets of behavior. Um, and Objection, what Your Honor. We're back to reading. She wasn't even looking down. She was looking at the jury. I don't. Go, go, ahead. go ahead. Please, please continue. So, what these tests show was that there was a high degree of um, serious violence perpetrated um, by Mr. Depp toward Ms. Hurd. Um, there was violence more on the mild level perpetrated by Ms. Hurd toward Mr. Depp, with one um, severe indicator, which was the punching that she indicated to me. Um, there were scales about negotiation, about how much this couple tries to figure out their problems. Um, they both scored, again, this is Ms. Heard reporting that, but they both scored in the high range, where they're both saying that, yes, we're trying to figure this out, we're trying to work out this relationship. Um, there were scores on the psychological aggression scale where um, Ms., uh, Mr. Depp engaged in more severe acts of psychological aggression, um, whereas Ms. Her did engage in also some mild and severe acts of psychological aggression. Um, the amount of injury that was reported was significantly higher and more severe by um, Ms. Hurd, what she was subjected to, and then she was subjected to um, sexual violence where um, Mr. Depp, based on her report, was subjected to none. And then the other, on the danger assessment scale, that there were a number of factors that were related to um, severity um, in in violent relationships and a risk factor when we look, as I said earlier, when um, behaviors come up on this scale, they're very worrisome, um, very scary, and we have to take them seriously. So there were a number of behaviors that came up on this scale, such as um, Mr. Depp's threatens to kill her, um, the increase in severity of the abuse, um, the forced sexual activity, the choking behavior, his obsessive jealousy. Objection foundation. Talking about the test results. I'm so overruled, go ahead. Please continue. Um, the obsessive jealousy, the control aspect, and um, his um, threatening of, of to suicide to kill himself. So those were risk factors um, that placed her in the increased danger range. Um, and this is a, a, a range that, you know, says that we certainly have to advise women of their risk and, and consult with um, law enforcement if they're involved or judges if they're involved um, because this means that a woman is at risk for more serious or lethal uh, domestic violence. So did the results of the psychological tests you administered to Amber Heard support a diagnosis of P PTSD? Objection leading. 
what, if any, psychological tests did you administer that supported a diagnosis of PTSD for Amber Heard? Sure. So um, there were four tests that supported that diagnosis. One was the PAI, uh, which was that 344 question large uh, scale personality inventory. On that test, her largest subscale, her, her highest subscale was the one that measures traumatic stress. Um, so that was clinically significant. On the TSI, two of her scales were the intrusive experiences dimension and the defensive avoidance dimension, two of the classic um, scales of trauma and PTSD. On the PCL, which is the post-traumatic stress disorder checklist five, um, that she scored in all four domains of PTSD, and that's an instrument that says how much, how much are you bothered by these symptoms, um, and in all four clusters, which would be the intrusive experiencing when things about the abuse or the trauma enter your mind when you did not want them, want them to. Sometimes they're cued, sometimes they're uncued. She answered in the avoidance category, which is a second category of PTSD, that I do things to try not to think about this, to try not to feel this to try not to get upset. Sometimes I avoid certain people because they become a trigger for me. She scored in the what we call the negative alterations in cognition and mood, changes in her thoughts and feelings as a result of the abuse and trauma, and also in the physiological hyperactivity activity, the hyperarousal, the hypervigilance, the startle response. So on the PCL, she endorsed symptoms in all four of those categories saying, you know, some of these symptoms are bothering me a lot. And then finally, the clinician administered uh, PTSD scale for the DSM-5. And what that allows me to do, unlike the PCL, is really look at symptom severity and, and symptom fr frequency. How is this really playing out for this individual? And similarly, she scored in all four categories of, um, of trauma and of having intrusive experiences and nightmares and avoidance efforts and physiological hyperactivity and changes in her mood and her thoughts. Um, and her total score was a 28, which falls in the moderate range, so that means that she has experiencing a moderate degree of post-traumatic stress disorder symptomatology. And those tests allow me to make that definitive diagnosis that she suffers from PTSD. Thank you. What, if any, consideration did you give to Amber Heard's history of childhood abuse in making your diagnosis? I mean, that was a significant consideration given that um, we know that childhood, uh, well, first of all, we know that people can experience multiple traumas across the lifespan. Um, and we wanted to make sure that the symptoms that she was experiencing were related to what she experienced with Mr. Depp and not her childhood. Um, and certainly, you know, earlier on in the evaluation and when I uh, evaluated and spoke with her, that was true. And that was also true on the latest measure, the clinician administered PTSD scale for DSM-5, the CAPS-5. Um, and that's because the content, you have to look at what is the content of the symptom. So it's not that someone says, oh yeah, something traumatic comes into my mind. No, what is it? What comes into your mind? What bothers you? What are the triggers? Um, and those were all specific to Miss Hurd's relationship with Mr. Depp. Um, the reason the childhood is also significant is that we know that if somebody suffers childhood abuse as a child, they are much more likely to have an adult revictimization. Um, and they're much more likely then to be more vulnerable to um, obtaining a PTSD, to getting PTSD, if they've had that prior vulnerability. Um, so it's a very strong vulnerability characteristic to obtaining PTSD when you have a subsequent trauma. Um, the other aspect about her childhood abuse is that she was raised in a family of violence. She was physically abused by her father. Uh, she saw her father abuse her mother. Her father was very explosive and had violent outbursts. And both her parents also struggled with substance abuse very significantly. So she had learned from a very early age how to caretake, how to live in a situation that is mired in chaos. How do I take care of a parent who's passed out, nodded out from heroin? And how do I get up and get my sister to school? She learned at a very early age that she had to figure out how to do this in this scenario. And I would say lastly, what that um, environment taught her was that 
She learned that she could love someone who hurts her. She knew that people who hurt her also can love her. And she learned how to have this tolerance for cognitive inconsistency, this tolerance for two should be diametrically opposed emotions. But she grew up knowing or believing, perhaps, that this could happen. Um, and she also believed that she could fix him, just like she tried to fix her father and just like she tried to fix her mother. She truly, truly believed that she could fix Mr. Depp and rid him of his substance abuse problems. But that did not work. Did you review Dr. Curry's CAPS-5 that she administered to Amber Heard? Yes, I did. Um, and what, if any, agreement did you have with Dr. Curry's interpretation of the CAPS-5? Um, I didn't agree with her interpretation, having uh, been a trauma psychologist for over 25 years and, and administered hundreds of these. Um, I found that there were flaws in how she chose to administer it, and then some of the coding um, misheard on that CAPS-5 uh, to Dr. Curry, certainly reported trauma-based symptomatology related to the abuse by Mr. Depp, but somehow that was not coded as such. And did you uh, review Dr. Curry's MMPI, too, that she administered on Amber Heard? Um, yes, I did. And do you agree with her interpretations on that test? No, I do not. Why not? Because this profile is a normal profile. It is, there are no clinical scores elevated above 65, which is one and a half standard deviations of the mean, which is what we use to determine clinical significance. Um, and if none of those scales are elevated, it becomes very difficult for us to make assumptions about a person's psychology and their functioning. Now remember, the psychological testing generates hypotheses about a person that we then, using our clinical judgment, have to make a decision about. We have to make an assessment about it. Um, and if none of those scales are elevated, it just doesn't give us rich information to make those determinations. The one scale which is accurate that was elevated was one that measures defensive responding, sort of a protective responding, a, a, an unwillingness to um, admit minor faults. That was elevated and that was true. Um, but the result of that is you have a, a defensive profile. You have somebody who's not giving you a lot of information. So the scales are all low. So there's no way you can take that MMPI and then say it meets uh, it's consistent with borderline personality disorder. You just don't have the symptom expression on it in order to do that. And that's my next question here. What, if any, diagnoses did you make of personality disorders for Amber Heard based on your testing? I did not make a personality disorder of Ms. Heard. Why not? For a number of reasons. Um, number one, a personality disorder requires a pervasive pattern in a variety of contexts. Two key words, pervasive pattern, variety of context. That means if her emotional instability, her affect dysregulation, or her fear of abandonment is only occurring in the relationship with Mr. Depp, and we don't have evidence of it before, and we don't have evidence of it after, it is not... All right, what our approach? Still with us in Los Angeles, California, former federal prosecutor Nima Romani, and I'd now like to welcome in Hampton, Virginia, Commonwealth Attorney Anton Bell. Anton, let me start with you. We all know that the objections are about to drive me crazy and all the approaching because we have a jury sitting there and their time is valuable. Put that aside. Tell me what you think of this expert's testimony. She just said she disagrees with the other expert and that Amber Heard does not have a personality disorder. Well, in watching her answer these questions, the thing that I love about her explanations, she gives you very detailed reasons and factors as to why she disagrees with Dr. Carey. In addition to that, if you notice, uh, juries pay attention to the parties and the litigants. And for the first time watching Amber Heard, I, show, I saw uh, some sense of, of hurt and pain in her face when she began to talk about her father and the abuse that she dealt with with her father and her mother and their addictions and how she said someone can still love you and yet hurt you. And you could see the, the, the pain that's in her to, to the point that she put her head down to a certain degree. That's the first time you saw her not really being robotic. 
Well, really great observation that you noticed that. And you're right, juries notice everything in the courtroom. Nemo, what's your takeaway so far from this expert's testimony? Ashley, I agree with Anton. Two key points here. Now we finally understand why Amber Heard's defense team put on Dr. Hughes first. She's laying the foundation. We know Amber Heard is going to talk about the abuse she suffered at the hands of her parents. So we got a little preview there. But importantly, we're finally seeing Johnny Depp and his attorneys on the defense. You saw it. Johnny rattled a little bit. He's squirming in his chair, turning around. He's making comments. And then his attorneys are objecting because this is bad evidence for them. So that's why you see them reacting the way they are for the first time in this trial, Ashley. Yep. And, you know, trial strategy, trial skills, all about being careful to make sure you protect your client's rights, you present the case to win, but also that you make sure that that jury doesn't hold anything against you as the lawyers against the, your client. So all of that comes into play. We are going to squeeze in a break. We'll take you back to court on the other side. The life of your membership. You have not missed any testimony of the expert who did a forensic evaluation of Amber Heard. Let's get you back into the courtroom. Still with us, attorneys Nima Romani, Anton Bell. I apologize, gentlemen, I may need to cut you off if they resume, but right now we know they're at a sidebar. So again, talking about just trial strategy, what do you think, Anton, um, this does for or against Amber Heard by presenting this psychologist first? I absolutely love the strategy because they're dealing with the foundation as to why she may have done certain things, reacted a certain way, and maybe even stayed in the in what all of us can now see was a very toxic relationship. So I love the fact that they have this expert in there and she is systematically breaking down every diagnosis that was given by Depp's uh, counselor or, or a psychologist, psychoanalyst. She's breaking down why those diagnoses were not actual factual because uh, she missed use or misdiagnose or didn't use the manuals correctly or didn't use those particular um, uh, systems correctly. So I am loving this strategy right now. And I have to say, Anton, you know, before we were talking with some legal analysts on another show prior to this testimony about is this a battle of the experts? And a lot of people feel like it's really not because it's all about these two movie stars. And that's what viewers are paying attention to. That's likely what jurors are going to pay attention to. But Nima, this is very important testimony, I think, to really lead us down the road of battle of the experts. Do you think now that it might end up to a being exactly that? Actually, I think it's more about the likability and credibility of Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, but the experts are important to lay that foundation, like Anton said. Amber Heard was behind, so we needed someone to set the stage for her testimony. She's an actress, of course, and everyone on social media seems to be Team Johnny Depp. I mean, if you just look at the comments, and there's no question that she's way behind, but I think folks are underestimating Amber Heard and her defense team. I'm not saying she's going to win, but I expect her to make a significant comeback when she takes the stand as early as tomorrow. And Anton, I know you mentioned earlier her reaction in, in listening to the expert testify about some of her childhood abuse and trauma and father, but right now she appears to look like she really has looked through the entire trial. Her emotions that we've seen in court haven't seemed to change much. Now we have heard directly from Chanley and our court TV team on the ground there that when she comes into court, she is smiling and looks very different than once she sits down at the table. Now let's talk about 
cross-examination rebuttal. I think this witness is going to be on the stand for quite some time, uh, ostensibly. And I also think, let's talk again trial skills, and let me break it down to this. Anton, how do you decide whether or not you're going to object, e even if you know it's an objection? Do you object every time? Absolutely not. I'm glad you brought that up, Ashley, because some of the objections by Depp's attorneys, I think, can frustrate, if not anger, jurors. You have to be very careful to choose wisely when you are going to object. Does it really hurt me, or should I just allow that information in? And then when you make the objection, make an objection that you know can score some points, not just with the jurors, but also legally to be able to uh, promote your theory of the case. And so you have to be extremely careful and strategic when you object because it can backfire if you do it too often. And not only that, but I will tell you, when I was listening to attorneys who would object to every single question for fair reasons, accurate reasons, but with real no end game and no reason to do it, I felt people would stop listening to that attorney because they just got tired of hearing it. So it does affect a jury. I agree with you, Anton. Gentlemen, you're both going to stay with us. They're at a sidebar still, so we'll squeeze in a break. When we come back, we will take you back to the testimony. Like no other. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Judge Ashley Wilcott. Honored to be with you. Thank you for joining us. We want to take you back into the courtroom in Fairfax, Virginia, where Amber Heard's first witness, who did an evaluation of her as a psychologist, is on the stand. There was a sidebar that lasted for a very long time. We're going to take you back to where testimony resumed, and you haven't missed a thing. Dr. Hughes, um did, uh, what if anything did Dr. Cowan say to you about any type of diagnoses of personality disorders? I, Dr. Cowan did not diagnose uh, Ms. Hurt with any personality disorder. And what if anything did Dr. Bonnie Jacobs say about diagnosing uh, Amber Heard with any personality disorders? And, and Dr. Jacobs similarly did not diagnose uh, Ms. Hurt with any personality disorder. Thank you. Now, let's turn back to intimate partner violence. What types of physical violence were reported to you? Um, so there were a number of physically violent behaviors that were reported, um, that Ms. Heard reported, that Mr. Depp perpetrated. Um, he pushed her, he shoved her, he slapped her with the front of his hand and the back of his hand. Um, he choked her, he slammed her into the wall, he pushed her and she fell down. Um, he kicked her in the back. Um, Again, without looking at my notes, that's the, what I can recall. Okay. And what type of injuries did Amber Heard report to you? She reported mostly um, bruising, pain, some cuts. Um, she reported vaginal pain from some of the sexual assaults. Um, she reported that she did have some scratches and cuts on her from broken glass. Um, she reported that she believed she may have lost consciousness two times, once in the Australia incident and once in the December um, 15th, 2015 incident. Okay. What type of coercive control uh, did was reported or did you find? Leading. Sustained. What, if any, uh, uh, coercive control uh, was reported to you? So the course of control that um, was determined in this relationship I found to be quite significant. Um, there were many, many instances where um, Mr. Depp tried to control um, how Miss Heard went about her career. Um, he didn't want her to show nudity. He didn't want her to show boob. He didn't want her to act with certain actors because of this obsessive jealousy. Um, he criticized her ambition. Um, he'd rather she not work. He called, you know, the ambition as something as a negative thing. Um, it made her very fearful to have to look at scripts or talk about scripts or talk about movie roles because he persistently put those down and told her she didn't need to work and she didn't need to do that. And um, the way this manifested as well is that he called 
almost every actor that she had to work with, um, males and females. So no matter what show she was filming or shooting, he would call the leading actor, he would call the director, he would tell you, I got eyes down there, I got eyes down on the set. Um, so she never felt safe to be herself and be a, an actress in these films or productions because she'd have to come home and then endure his anger at her for doing something or for not doing something. When she was filming and he was in the same town, she feared that he would show up on the set and, you know, to know what her call sheet, what she was filming that day. She, you know, even told her assistant, don't give it to him, don't let him see it so that he won't show up. And sometimes he did. Um, so it was very uh, trepidatious for her and very anxiety provoking that he continued to do this. Um, he tried to control what she wore. When he, when she was going out with him, things were fine, but he told her often, no woman like mine is going to dress like a whore, um, and didn't want her to wear revealing clothing, um, and, or revealing clothing according to him. Um, she recalled an incident when she was going on uh, a job audition, and he didn't look sexy, so she didn't look revealing, and continued to try to plead with him about what jobs she could take and she could not take. Um, this made her be very sort of restrictive and try to conceal things. She would hide her scripts because she couldn't read them in front of him because he would put them down or want to see where there might be nudity, where there might be something where she's doing a love scene. Um, and then every almost every person that she was in a film with, there would be those barrages of the consistent accusations of infidelity. Um, and we saw that on the Australia pictures, the Billy Bob. He was one person that he continued, you know, to berate her about having an affair with. That's what obsessive control looks like, those messages on the mirror. Um, when you look at how he wanted her to um, be, there was some interference with, with the family, with her, with her sister, when, her, when some things were leaked. You know, he was obsessed believing that it was Whitney who did it, and, and eventually Miss Heard had to succumb and say, okay, yes, it was, and then alienate herself from her sister because she just couldn't take the fights anymore. She just couldn't take the constant barrage of, of criticism. Um, so there were many instances when, um, in terms of their interactions of, she would have to text him right back, but when he would text, when she would text him, he could not answer for days. Um, and it's this sort of, when we talk about, you know, the ghosting, but you, your husband doesn't ghost you, your, your partner doesn't ghost you. Um, and there were so many times of this sort of withdrawal of affection, which was on his terms and when he wanted to do it. Um, I'm aware that there is, you know, testimony in this case that, you know, Mr. Depp decided to leave because he didn't want to be violent. And I do think that's true sometimes. I think he did leave in times where he didn't want an altercation. He did leave after an altercation. He did leave and then came back and continued the altercation. So leaving wasn't the defining variable. The problem was that, you know, with this obsessiveness and this perseveration that he had, the fight would always come back. So leaving might end the argument for that moment, but Ms. Heard knew he was always going to come back and he was going to, you know, start the interrogation once again. And what is the effect of the coercive control on Amber Heard? I mean, the effect was drastic. She talked to me that she, you know, her roles consistently dropped over the time that she was in the relationship with Mr. Depp just because it was so difficult to, to go on auditions, to, to want to be in, in a different location with him. Whenever she was not on location um, with him, it was very stressful. It was very anxiety-provoking because of the accusations of infidelity. Um, we, we heard that through Isaac Baruch's testimony when she called and was saying, babe, there's no one here, there's no one here. That was something that she had to do repeatedly and constantly over the course of the relationship. So it caused a significant amount of anxiety, of distress, of, of having to try to conceal and maneuver around him to, to try to have the career that she wanted to have. It made her hypervigilant um, and definitely contributed to sort of her psychological symptomatology getting worse over time. What about sexual violence? 
So there was a number of incidents of sexual violence reported um, in this relationship. Um, those um, are documented early on in Dr. Bonnie Jacobs' notes, um, where when Mr. Depp was drunk or high, he threw her on the bed, ripped off her nightgown, and tried to have sex with her. Um, there were times when he forced her to give him oral sex when he was angry. These weren't in, in loving moments. These were angry moments, ang moments of dominance, moments of him trying to get control over her. Um, there was a time when they were in Hicksville in, in, in the trailer, I don't want to say trailer park, but I guess there's trailer park. It is a trailer park um, where he was accusing her of, of a woman hitting on Amber. And that, that was the problem. Amber um, got accused of women hitting on her and it got accused of men hitting on her. So there were was, there was so many targets that um, came through in his obsessive jealousy. Um, but when he, um, on that incident, when Kelly Sue um, was accused of hitting on Miss Heard and they went back into the trailer, um, Mr. Depp performed a, a cavity search and uh, ostensibly was looking for drugs and felt it acceptable to rip off her nightgown and, and stick his fingers up her vagina to look for cocaine, thought that maybe she was hiding them there. And again, these incidents often happened in a, in a drug-fueled rage. Um, there was another incident in the Bahamas where when he got angry, um, he took his fingers and he put them in her vagina and moved her around violently in the closet. Um, again, an act of sexual violence. And of course, um, the incident in, in Australia was one of the most severe instances of sexual violence that um, Miss Heard had to endure, in which when he was beating her and she and um, penetrated her with that bottle. Um, and Miss Heard reported to me of, of dissociating and, and going outside of her body. And the only thing she was thinking is, oh God, I hope it's not the broken one. What if any psychological abuse did you find? Um, there was a number of, of psychologically abusive behaviors, as I stated, um, you know, Ms. Hurd admitted to me um, and reported that she engaged in those behaviors as well. Um, she reported that she um, did call him names and offensive comments and said things to him that were horrible um, and that she was incredibly um, saddened and horrified by her behavior. And, and looking back, she, at, at this point, not being in the constant barrage of abuse, does not recognize her. Um, the abuse by Mr. Depp. He called her a number of names. Um, ambition. Ambition was a weaponized term in that relationship. Um, so he called her a lot of names and, and humiliated her. And of course, I think we talked about the intimidation tactics that, you know, Mr. Depp was often banging and throwing and hitting things um, in the household, which sort of got the tension to um, rise up very significantly, very quickly. Can you tell me how you conducted your analysis to arrive at these conclusions? Sure. So what I, I did was look at the incidents that were reported and look at the corroborating data around it. Um, so as we stated, most of these um, incidents of intimate partner violence happen behind closed doors. Not everyone is going to witness what the parties are reporting behind closed doors. So you look at what is the, what is the data that surrounds it. Is there any data before it? Is there any data after it? Is the person telling? Is the victim telling somebody in real time about what's happening? Are there therapy notes? Are there pictures? Are there text messages that sort of allow us to fill in the pieces of the picture, even though we don't have exactly what happened at that moment, the more um, collateral that we have and the consistency across those data points, it gives us greater confidence in our results. Can, can you give us some examples? Um, sure. So, Vague. Overruled a lot. So, um, for example, the Boston plane incident, I believe, without looking, I know May 24th, 2014. This is the incident where um, Ms. Hurd and Mr. Depp were going to fly back to L.A. and spend the weekend together. They were shooting at different sites. Um, Ms. Hurd is on the plane waiting for Mr. Depp to come on in the tarmac. He's um, reportedly sitting on the, in the SUV 
smoking and drinking, smoking weed and drinking. Um, she is filming with um, James Franco at this point, and um, she gets on the plane and he starts talking about James Franco, um, you know, making a lot of um, uh, derogatory comments about her and, um, you know, I hope you had fun with your escapades and, and some more um, inflammatory language. And then in uh, an argument when she got up to leave, he kicked her in the back and she went forward on the plane. Um, to the front of the plane because he sat in the back of the plane. So if I look at what is the corresponding data to this, there's a therapy note, several notes in Bonnie Jacobs' records that talk about Mr. Depp's increasing use of alcohol and his obsessive jealousy around James Franco before this Boston plane incident. After the incident, Ms. Heard told her friend Io. She told her friend Savannah. She told her friend Rocky. Ms. Heard did not go home. She was afraid to go home. So she went to a hotel because when Johnny was in these states, he would often show up because he's still in that drinking and drugging phase. Um, and, and he talked about that. That was the roxycodone before he detoxed. You know, he was still in that, you know, high substance abuse phase that he would often show up at night and that did not feel safe. There was a text. Disturbing details of obsessive controlling and sexually violent behaviors by Johnny Depp against Amber Heard. Now, what happened? This is a snapshot of what I think we can expect to hear from the witnesses presented by Amber Heard. But if they don't collaborate this, corroborate rather, this version of facts being told by this expert, Amber Heard might have a problem. There's a lot that we're gonna wanna cover and unpack. You won't miss any of the testimony. 770. Dr. Don Hughes is really providing disturbing details about what Johnny Depp has done to Amber Heard. Now remember, how would she know those details? Well, from Amber Heard directly. You haven't missed any of her testimony. Let's go back to court. Stephen Dukes, Mr. Depp's assistant. All right, you want to approach? Still with us, attorneys Nima Romani and Anton Bell. Well, gentlemen, you don't have to hear from me as to what I think about the fact there is another sidebar. Johnny Depp there is smiling and laughing. I've seen him do that a few times, what I would describe as a laugh. Anton Bell, what are your thoughts as you're listening to these details of really horrific sexual violence and obsessive controlling behavior? So, Ashley, you, you hit the nail just on the nose because I want to know, is there any corroboration to these accusations? Because even as Dr. Hughes is describing some of it, the behavior of Johnny Depp, uh, she seems very biased in her uh, communication of those details. And she seems to uh, exacerbate the accusations by her of Johnny Depp, but she seems to mitigate the accusations concerning what her may have done to Depp by making excuses for why she may have said things and done things. And so uh, that is something that's beginning to stick out a little bit more to me. And Nima, if this were your witness, would you be worried about the number of tiny details she's providing about each alleged incident because you then have to have a witness, whether it's Amber Heard or a friend of Amber Heard's, testify to those details being the same. Well, Ashley, we know Amber Heard is going to talk about all this. There's no question that she will. That's why they put her on first. And this is what the sidebar is about, by the way. So a lot of what Dr. He was just talking about is hearsay, right? But experts can rely on hearsay. Now, each state is different. Some states require for an expert to testify about hearsay evidence that they're relying on, that there's a separate hearsay objection. So I know what's going on here. There's multiple layers of hearsay, but she's able to get in a lot of testimony by other providers, specifically both Depp and Heard's doctors that did not diagnose Heard with a personality disorder. Now, with respect to these graphic details, and a lot of this came out in the UK, Heard has already testified there. So I fully expect her to be able to corroborate all this or there's no way that Heard's defense team would be 
drawing this information out of Dr. Hughes, Ashley. And I do want to clarify for our viewers your discussion of hearsay, which is spot on, of course, Nima, not surprising coming from either of you, but that there's the party exception. What do I mean by that? It means any witness can testify as to what a party has told them. So any witness, including this expert, can testify as to what Amber told her. If uh, Johnny had told her anything, they could testify to that as well. What do you expect next? What would you want to see next, Anton, in this trial for the case of Amber Heard? Corroboration, corroboration, corroboration. I want there to be someone outside of Heard who can corroborate what Dr. Hughes has been detailing concerning the abuse. Someone who can say, I saw, someone who can say, I heard the commotion, someone that can just simply corroborate that this is not some type of uh, uh, accusation that just heard is saying just to kind of counter what Depp has said about her abuse allegations. And I'm hoping we can look back. I don't know that we have control of it here. It is a court TV camera in the courtroom, but did you all just notice the gallery? Because the gallery, everybody, of course, naturally are going to kind of look at one another. But it, look, it looks like it's almost a, a Right, so there, Chanley Painter, our own Chanley Painter in red, looking lovely as usual, talking to the PR person for Amber Heard. But look at the rest of them all kind of craning and looking and talking. It That does not look like any courtroom in which I've presided by in terms of demeanors and when there's a sidebar you're still in court you still shouldn't be talking you shouldn't be chomping on your gum i mean these are things that i just noticed as a judge anton any thoughts about any of that oh not only that ashley but the fact is we're talking about very very serious allegations of violence sexual violence physical violence and for them to be with have such a light-hearted um uh, disp uh composition is is struggling to me all right, let's go back to court. Go past that text and continue after that text. I'm um, sure. So there was um, Mr. Depp apologized to Ms. Heard for that incident. Um, Mr. Depp said in his UK testimony, well, I, I only maybe playfully tapped her on the back with my foot. Um, Mr. Depp texted Paul Bettany and talked about how he was so drunk and out of control and engaged in bad behavior. He texted his friend, Patty Smith, a very similar type of text about how drunk and out of control he was. Um, and then finally, Amber Heard wrote an email um, talking about how distressed and, and heartbroken she was. Objection, hearsay. I, 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 I mean, I don't agree. I, 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 I know it. Sustained, I'll sustain the objection. Next question. All right. Can you give can you give another example? I, I think those are all I can um, remember at this point. Okay. Um, what if any? Uh, what if any? Um, sorry, I'm going to have to go a little bit further here. So. We are coming up to the top of the hour. I want to thank Nima Romani and Anton Bell for joining us today in their great expert analysis. I also want to thank you all, the viewers, for joining us here and abroad. We are going to stay pit for Michael Ayala up next. Drinkhint.com and order today. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Michael Ayala. All I want to do is um, support women and change the narrative and change the conversation surrounding uh, how we as a culture deal with women who do dare to come up against powerful men and the people that uh, aim to benefit from that power and maintain the status quo. I am not speaking about myself. I'm not speaking about my relationship. I'm not, why would I? That's Amber Heard speaking out before the start of her legal battle with ex-husband Johnny Depp. The Fairfax County courtroom will soon hear from Heard's account of the allegedly abusive relationship she says she had with Johnny Depp. Now, sources tell Court TV Heard is expected to take the stand tomorrow. Now, earlier today, Dean Team Depp rested their case in chief, ending with more testimony about the effect of Heard's op-ed 
and what it had on Depp's earnings. Now, the weeks-long trial has provided shocking details into the toxic couple's time together ever since they met on the set of the 2011 film, The Rum Diaries. All right, I want to get you right back into the courtroom. Dr. Dawn Hughes is on direct examination. Let's take you back in. That Amber Heard used psychological abuse and some reactive physical violence, I think I heard you say. Is that correct? Objection leading. O overruled. Can you please explain to the jury what you meant by that? Yes, that is correct. That, um, you know, Amber Heard reported to me um, some of the behaviors that she used that were psychologically aggressive. Um, the name calling, the putting him down and, and calling him um, very bad names and insulting his, his fatherhood. And she was uh, very shamed and remorseful about that. She also indicated, you know, using, and as some of the testing showed, minor forms of violence, pushing, shoving, um, throwing objects. We see that a lot with um, women when there's not proportional force. Women are more likely to throw objects. Um, and then the more severe act of, of punching him, which a punch falls in the more severe category. And, and the context, um, as she explained it, was that he was coming after um, Whitney and she stood, her sister, and she stood in the way and she punched him. Now, does that make uh, Amber Heard a perpetrator? of intimate partner violence? Objection leading. O overruled. So, so that was one of the tasks that I had to consider. That was one of the hypotheses that I had to consider. And given um, all of the other data, um, that was not my opinion. OK, thank you. Now, you stated that you read a number of therapy records. Please tell the jury why are therapy records important? Therapy records are critical for a forensic psychologist. When we have the opportunity to go back in time and see what a person was dealing with, what the content of their distress was, and what the symptoms of their distress was, it really gives us a snapshot in time. So they become very critical as part of the overall forensic psychological evaluation. Because we, as psychologists, understand how people sort of treat in therapy and what to look for. Um, so in looking back at um, uh, Ms. Hurd's therapy records, we see sort of real time unfolding of this dynamic in this relationship. We see early on in her notes with and her report with Bonnie Jacobs and in Dr. Bonnie Jacobs notes, reports of constant concerns about Mr. Depp's substance abuse, constant concerns about him passing out and vomiting, constant concerns about not Objection, wanting Objection, Your Honor. Hearsay. She can characterize that and say she relied on that. Overruled. Thank you. Please continue. Um, constant concerns about how do I get him into treatment? How do I get him help? Um, Ms. Hurd starts going to Al-Anon at this point, early 2012, in the beginning of the relationship, because she has to figure out and wants to figure out a way to support the man that she's dating right now and the man who she's falling madly in love with. There are reports in Dr. Jacobs' notes early on about his controlling behavior, about his jealousy behavior, about him not, of not wanting to do certain jobs, of not wanting her to wear certain clothes. So this is going back to 2012 um, with no indication of why would she be saying that but for the sole purpose of trying to get help and trying to get guidance in this relationship that she finds so difficult. Um, there are indications, as I mentioned before, of the sexual assault and the sexual abuse and, and how he would, you know, when he was angry and when he was drunk, it was mostly drug and, and, and dr alcohol um, fueled rage when he would, you know, throw her on the bed and try to have sex with her. And then, you know, if he was not able to perform, he would get more angry at her and blame her. So we have this dynamic of blaming her for his inability to take responsibility for his behavior. Those themes were throughout Dr. Jacobs' notes. Did, um, did Dr. Jacobs assign any diagnoses to Amber Heard? Um, she did. Early on, she diagnosed her with panic disorder um, and then later with post-traumatic stress disorder. All right. And did Dr. Jacobs diagnose Amber Heard with borderline personality disorder? No, she did not. Histrionic personality disorder? No, she did not. And is that important? 
That's very important. When we're trying to figure out the course of somebody's illness, the course of somebody's psychiatric difficulties, as I stated, well, I don't think I got to state, um, personality disorders usually start in adolescence early. Objection. Okay. I'll sustain the objection. Okay. Next question. Okay. Um, you also stated that you reviewed Dr. Connell Cohen's treatment notes, correct? Correct. And you also read his deposition testimony? Correct. And you had uh, uh, how long of a collateral interview with him? Uh, I believe it was two hours. Okay. And what, what did you get from, from all of that data? So by the time that she gets to Dr. Connell Cohen, which is 2014, I believe, uh, September 2014, is when Dr. Kipper comes on the scene. Ms. Hurd's psychological functioning is, is significantly deteriorated. She's suffering more anxiety, more sleeplessness, more agitation, more emotional dysregulation, this fluctuation in moods. And when you sort of look at the records of what happened in those first two years from Dr. Jacobs, and now we have up to Dr. Connell Cohen, and we see all of the incidents that she was exposed to, including the sexual violence and the coercive control, it makes sense to me that her status, her psychological functioning has deteriorated. Um, and in Dr. Connell Cohen's notes, that's what he's always trying to do. He's trying to help her, help Mr. Depp, help her act in a way so that Mr. Depp does not hurt her. Um, Mr. Depp, I mean, pardon me, Dr. Connell Cohen was very concerned for uh, Amber Heard's safety, as was Dr. Bonnie Jacobs. Dr. Jacobs was very concerned for her safety, and she continued to talk about safety aspects for Ms. Heard, as was Connell Cohen. Um, you know, they did, both of them, both therapists, understood and Ms. Heard talked to them about it, that there were times that she fought back and she used violence and times that she screamed and she said things that she didn't want to. Um, but nevertheless, that did not change the balance for them either. And they were very concerned um, that because of Mr. Depp's significant substance abuse and his sort of poorly controlled anger that at some point he was going to seriously hurt her. Did Dr. Cohen provide Ms. Hurd with a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder? No, he did not. Did he diagnose Amber Hurd with histrionic personality disorder? No, he did not. Is that important? It's important that you are, have a, an individual, Ms. Hurd, who's in therapy for over two years with one therapist and over two years with another therapist, and you're not seeing those characteristics of a personality disorder. If, if the, the manifestation of a person's difficulties and illness and symptomatology is better explained by another disorder, then you don't qualify for the personality disorder. You can't get the diagnosis. I mean, that's part of the criteria. So if it's not a pervasive pattern in a variety of contexts, and it can't be better explained by her trauma experience and the exposure and the symptoms as a result of that trauma, then you don't get a personality disorder. And that's why they didn't diagnose it. Did you read Dr. Amy Banks' deposition testimony? Yes, I did. And what were her findings? So she, Dr. Banks had one session, um, one couple session with Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd. Um, Dr. Banks is um, uh, very reputable. She works up at the Harvard Medical School Cambridge Victim of the Violence Program, which is a very well-known program for understanding. Um, the objection, Your Honor. What, what's the objection? It's non-responsive to the question. The question was, what was the findings? All right. Tell, tell us, tell the jury who Dr. Amy Banks is. And just like I said, so she's somebody who has um, a wealth of experience in understanding intimate partner violence and the dynamics of, of uh, violent relationships. But she only had one session with the couple, um, and it was her determination when they were both there and the violence was talked about that Mr. Depp did not deny the violence that he um, perpetrated toward Ms. Hurd. Um, she also did as everybody has, all of our other therapists, because Ms. Hurd admitted as such that she also used low levels of violence as well. So um, Dr. Amy Banks had that uh, opinion. Did you review Dr. Laurel Anderson's treatment notes and read her deposition? Uh, yes, I did. Okay, and what was the significance of 
what you learned from Dr. Anderson. So and Dr. Anderson similarly thought that there was violence and abuse in this relationship. She was the one therapist out of the four who qualified it as mutual abuse, um, which um, the termination I've talked to you about, I, I don't necessarily agree with. Um, but she did see and did understand that there was violence and abuse by Mr. Depp. What was most notable was that after the December 15th, 2015 episode, Ms. Heard called her in addition to calling Connell Cohen and reached out to a number of people, but she saw Dr. Anderson in her office and Dr. Anderson saw two bruises on her face and told me, my husband kicked me and he pushed me and he punched me in the head. And should I call the police? Objection, Your Honor. What should You're I saying. do? I, she's not reading, Your Honor. She's I'm just sorry. saying the significance. I sustain the objection. Next okay. question. All right. What were your uh, what conclusions did you make as a result of Dr. L what you reviewed for Dr. Laurel Anderson? My take of reading Dr. Laurel Anderson's deposition and, and seeing her, you know, redacted notes was that, you know, from my professional opinion, this was a very serious incident and a very serious um, allegation of intimate partner violence by Mr. Depp. If a patient comes into my office with two bruises and alleges being pushed, shoved, and kicked by her partner, I'm going to be very concerned and I'm going to mobilize a lot more resources to help that individual. Um, and for some reason, um, that did not happen for Ms. Heard. Okay. What are your overall clinical impressions from reading these notes? from Amber Heard's treatment providers and their couples therapy, therapists. Objection compound. Uh, all right, sustained. What are your overall clinical impressions from reading what you told everybody you read? Uh, objection compound. I, I, I mean, I don't know how to get it less compound, Your Honor. Overruled, go ahead. Thank you. So my overall impression of, of the, the treatment notes was, you know, there's significant support for the fact that there was intimate partner violence in this relationship. Um, it was consistently reported over time, um, and there were couples therapists who saw and understood that. Um, so, you know, there were, uh, Mr. Depp also attended a session with Dr. Connell Cohen with misheard. Um, and in that session, um, he was very belligerent and mean and yelling and intimidating. And he even got up and stormed out, rolled a joint, and then came back later. Dr. Connell Cohen's impression was this is somebody who's poorly controlled. That's the same thing that Dr. Laurel Anderson said about him. And he stormed out of one of those sessions too. So there were a total of six sessions, couple session, but Mr. Depp stormed out of two of them. So there are only four couple sessions um, for these two individuals in this just highly volatile, highly damaging um, relationship that was, you know, punctuated by the coercive control and the intimate partner violence. Hmm. Wow, just strong testimony for Amber Heard's team. Uh, Dr. Hughes is really going through a number of diagnoses by a number of doctors who said that this wasn't at all about abuse by Amber Heard. She was just responding to the abuse and control by Johnny Depp, a very different narrative than we've been hearing over the last 13 days or so. All right, we'll get you right back in the courtroom. You won't miss a thing, but we're gonna take a break right now. But before we go, here's a quick reminder. Tonight and every night for the duration of the Depp Heard defamation trial, Join me as I bring you a special edition of Testimony of the Day. We're going to get you caught up on all the best moments from the day's courtroom action during a special hour starting at 7 p.m. Eastern. And still to come here, we're going to have more from the Amber Heard case, so keep it right here on Court TV. 4-9 now. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Michael Ayala. We're continuing with our coverage of the dueling defamation suits featuring Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. Amber Heard has started her case. She has called her first witness, and it's a Dr. Dawn Hughes. She spent about 20 hours or so with Amber Heard and has diagnosed her, and she's doing a great job, in my estimation, of changing the narrative that the aggressor in this relationship was Amber Heard. She's saying no, it was Johnny Depp. She said, according to her estimation, uh, Amber Heard does suffer from PTSD, and she suffers from PTSD because of the abuse of Johnny Depp. She's continuing here with her direct examination, so let's get you right back in the courtroom. Make about Amber Heard's psychological status. 
over the, that period? I mean, the record was very clear that her psychological status deteriorated as she was in the relationship with Mr. Depp. She kept getting worse. She was losing weight. She, by the end, she was down to, I think, 105 pounds from about 125, 130. She was taking significantly more medication than she's ever taken in her life. She was having more panic, more anxiety, more distress, um, more affect dysregulation, just really uh, uh, an inability to regulate her mood, more anger outbursts. Um, so it can significantly deteriorate over time. You talked about weight. What, if any, diagnoses did um, Bonnie Jacobs make about Amber Heard having uh, an eating disorder? There was no evidence in the record that Ms. Heard had an eating disorder. Uh, what, if any, observations did you make about whether Dr. Cohen Connell thought she had an eating disorder? There was no indication in his record that she had an eating disorder. Now, what, if any, uh, observations did you make about uh, the impact of Mr. Depp's substance abuse? So the substance abuse was a very relevant and, and complicating factor to this relationship. When you pair that level of substance abuse with the level of intimate partner violence and coercive control, it's a very, very disastrous mix. And one of the things that, that happens with the substance abuse is a very similar dynamic that happens with the intimate partner violence, that there's, there's the lying, there's the hiding, there's the cheating, there's the you know, obfuscation, you know, the rational rationalization about the drinking, the rationalization about the violence, the trying to, you know, promises, I'm going to do better, I'm going to get clean and sober, I'm not going to hit you anymore. Objection, so, Your Honor. Can, can I be heard? Can you approach? All right, so it looks like they're going to a quick sidebar, some of the testimony causing problems for the Depp team. Let me bring in quickly my guest, Jennifer L. Cody. She's uh, standing by. She's a trial attorney. Um, uh, Jennifer, uh, as I said coming into this uh, uh, testimony, I thought she was doing a fairly good job of reframing the narrative in this case. I mean, it is a completely opposite 360 from what we heard on Johnny Depp's case, that she was the aggressor. She's making a good case that it was actually Johnny, and all the reactions that we saw, saw from Amber Heard were just really reactions to him and his issues. Yeah, I mean, I think defense is doing a great job right now at disproving and impeaching every single witness that Mr. Depp put on the stand for uh, his, his side. And right now, we're really going to be seeing the counter arguments that are going to be made and that are going to play out. So it's going to be very interesting to see. Yeah, you know what I thought was strong about her testimony? She brought in the fact that um, Amber Heard had seen therapists, uh, three or four different therapists, and none of them uh, had diagnosed her with a personality disorder. They had been treating her over a period of time. And of course, um, Dr. Shannon Curry, who was the expert called by Johnny Depp, did in fact say she had a couple of different personality disorders. I thought that was very strong. Folks who were seeing her over time didn't diagnose it, but over the course of, I, think, I believe it was about 19 hours of, of, of consultation with Amber Heard, she came up with two different personality disorders. Correct. I, th I think it's very, very interesting to see that in a course of 19 hours, you can find the personality disorder. So I think they're going, that's what they're playing to right now. Defense is really playing to the fact that, okay, they only saw her for 19 hours and you mean to tell me that she's diagnosed with personality disorder? They're doing a fantastic job at contradicting every expert that plaintiff has put on the stand. So it's, it's, not looking good right now. Yeah, it's, go, it's going strong for Amber. All right, it uh, looks like the sidebar is over. Jennifer, so stand by. We're going to go back into the courtroom. Um, what, if any, dynamics and coping styles uh, are connected to the substance abuse by Mr. Depp? So they share similarities. There's a lot of lying when somebody's a substance abuser. There's a lot of hiding. There's a lot of concealment. There's a lot of rationalization. There's a lot of blame. Um, blaming your partner for your inability to stay clean and sober. Um, there's a lot of the promises to change and, and the promises to get better. Um, so a lot of these dynamics sort of co-occur, you know, in a situation of, of substance abuse and domestic violence. They're very 
very similar. Um, the difficulty in, in this relationship was that the majority of the violent episodes and the sexually violent episodes were in these alcohol and drug fueled rages. That was predominantly when those happened. When he, he wasn't in those stages, we still saw the obsessive jealousy and the course of control and the possessiveness um, that still persisted. But when the alcohol and the drugs came together is when Amber Heard was more um, in, in danger of being hurt by him. Why didn't Amber Heard leave the relationship sooner? Well, I mean, you know why. Objection, she... speculation, Your Honor. What, do you, have you formed, uh, uh, based on your experience and based on your 29 hours uh, of uh, uh, clinical evaluation of Amber Heard, what is your understanding of why Amber Heard didn't leave the relationship earlier? Objection beyond the, the scope of I, the I, disclosure. I, I, it, it clearly is not. I mean, it's clearly in the disclosure. Point, point to where you say it's not. I mean, point to where you say it's not. You're not. Could you come forward? All right, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to stop it right where it is, get you right back in the courtroom when we come back. So keep it right here on Court TV. Good work pays off. I'm Tanley Painter in Fairfax, Virginia for the Johnny Depp defamation case. And this is Court TV, your front row seat to justice. After 13 days of testimony and some 30 witnesses called by Team Johnny Depp, today Amber Heard's lawyers began their case in chief. To set the stage for Heard's highly anticipated testimony, her attorneys called as their first witness a Dr. Dawn Hughes, a forensic psychologist with a specialization in interpersonal violence. Now, Dr. Hughes explained the many forms domestic violence can take, educating the jury about the patterns that exist in intimate partner relationships as a way of highlighting Johnny Depp's actions and how they fit squarely into the definition of domestic abuse. She then told the jury that she diagnosed Amber as suffering from PTSD post-traumatic stress disorder and the cause intimate partner violence presumably at the hands of Johnny Depp this is of course in contradiction to what they heard from team Depp's expert Dr. Shannon Curry who found no evidence of PTSD at all all right let's get back into the courtroom now for continued testimony of Dr. Dawn Hughes now, you your you indicated that your main opinion was that Amber Heard's report of violence and abuse in her relationship with Mr. Depp is consistent with what is known as intimate partner violence, correct? That's correct. Okay. And, and why did you believe that Amber Heard, what, why did you have, what formed your basis of that opinion in a nutshell? I'm asked and answered, Your Honor. Overruled, I'll allow it. The basis of the opinion was looking at all the dynamics uh, in this relationship, looking at not just the hitting and the yelling, um, but looking at how much more hitting was done, looking at the coercive control, the obsessive jealousy, the possessiveness, the sexual violence, the choking behavior, the threats to kill. Those are all, as I stated, very significant and often found in cases of, of lethal domestic violence. Those were significant severity factors, and looking at all those, um, that's what tipped the scales, that even though she yelled and said some horrible things and hit him, it never was able to shift the balance of power and control in that relationship. Now, you have discussed with Amber Heard and you have reviewed and evaluated um, the emotional impact on Amber Heard uh, as a result of emotional distress, uh, as a result of the three counterclaim statements, correct? The the three uh, alleged defamatory statements made by uh, Mr. Depp through Mr. Waldman, correct? That is correct. Okay. Objection. And compound leading. I was just oh, over. I'll go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Could you please tell the jury what psychological impact these statements had on Amber Heard? Yes, so there were three statements that I evaluated. Um, may I ch check my notes to give you the dates and my recollection so that you can, I can be clear? Since I couldn't put it in, this might be the fastest way, Your Honor. I, I just, I'd rather she not address the court. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Can, yes. 
Um, so there were three statements on April 8th, 2020, April 27th, 2020, and June 24th, 2020, that I um, queried her about and asked her about. Um, the one that, um, what happens is if somebody who, like Ms. Hurd, has um, trauma-based symptoms and PTSD, we say that PTSD is a cue-based disorder. There are things that happen in the environment that trigger it and make it worse. Um, and having to have to refute um, that your report of, of violence and abuse is a hoax um, makes one be act, makes that trauma activated. So it makes the PTSD symptoms at that time become more intense and more severe. So she would have more intrusive thoughts, more nightmares, more sleeplessness, more um, uh, difficulty engaging with other people, um, depression, sadness, stress. Um, all of that would happen when one of these statements came out. The one that was, you know, the most difficult was the one um, where they um, said that her sexual violence Objection, Your was Honor. a hoax. What's the objection? I think she's going to the... To, to oh, I'll overrule objection. Good. Please continue. The one that was most difficult um, for Ms. Hurd was the statement about calling her sexual violence a hoax. Um, as I stated earlier, um, most women try very uh, diligently to put that sexual violence in a box, bury it down, not want to talk about it, not want to, you know, have anything related to it um, come up. And, you know, she's done, you know, by my estimation and her coping, although she suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder, she also has a high degree of coping strategies. But when this would happen, it sort of would just, everything would deteriorate. Um, and this is the, the one thing that women are always afraid of, that no one's going to believe them. No one's going to take them seriously. And when somebody comes out in, in the popular media and calls your experience a hoax, um, that lended itself to um, more severe psychological and traumatic symptomatology for her. Dr. Hughes, are all of your opinions that you have provided today uh, within a reasonable degree of psychological probability or certainty? Yes, they are. Thank you. I have no further questions. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, this is a good time to go ahead and uh, break for the day. We can have cross-examination and redirect tomorrow of, of this witness, of Dr. Hughes. So if you could have a, uh, a good evening, do not discuss the case with anybody, and uh, uh, don't do any outside research, okay? And we'll see you in the morning.